Hello and welcome to Motlow College's script analysis for the theater class. I am your professor, Emily Seal, and today we'll be looking at chapter one of script analysis for actors, directors, and designers by James Thomas. Um, as I go through this lecture, I'll be using the third edition, um, but I know some of you in our age of textbook craziness may be using a different in this edition and I apologize for any confusion that may cause but um, James Thomas has started this book I think very ambitiously kind of giving you a bird's eye view of stuff that he'll unpack later so if it feels like I'm moving a little bit fast today then I apologize and just know that we'll come back later and sort of deep dive into some of these bigger issues. Another way that I think James Thomas was pretty ambitious with our first chapter of the textbook was by tackling Hamlet. <laughs> now, um, my dear niece asked me just the other day, what is your favorite play? And um, it's a toss up for me. My, you know, my dear colleague David Crutcher likes to say that his favorite play is whichever one he's working on and I think that's true once you start digging into a script you get an appreciation for the script and um, you know you, you find these little hints that playwrights leave you or that um, you know the first director left you in the stage directions and it's so exciting um, but Hamlet is one of my favorite plays not that I just sit around and watch it on a Friday night but the poetry in it. They're just these lines that are almost um, just so close to my heart as to something that I repeat to myself or something that calms me or comforts me. What a piece of work is man, how noble in reason. Um, you know, just some of these beautiful, poetic, great deep thoughts that I can chew on and come back to over and over again. So um, that to say, Hamlet is notoriously complicated. If you want to start a fight in a green room, um, you know, just start talking Hamlet and interpretation and people will. Um, all the great minds have interpreted it. Freud, um, you know, all of these great thinkers have speculated on Hamlet. So in some ways it's a good one to start with, but in other ways it can be an intimidating um, first choice. So I will try, as James Thomas does, to create this action analysis in a way that's simplified. And of course we'll be using Hamlet to analyze. So I go into this lecture assuming that you've read both chapter one of this James Thomas book and the entire play of Hamlet. I'll be using pictures from the David Tennant Hamlet. Um, this one is provided through the BBC, so it's pretty accessible for us through our um, streaming media and other online resources. Um, you are welcome to watch whichever version of Hamlet if that helps you, or you're welcome to just read it if you are um, wanting to have a more open interpretation. Uh, then obviously we're free you just read it but I'm going to use pictures from the David Tennant Hamlet um, he is my favorite because I think he is so handsome and witty and charming and um, uh, I used to like him in um, a lot of his other kind of BBC shows but I, I digress let's get to it there is nothing either good or bad that thinking makes it so and there is that's a famous Hamlet quote um, just kind of about the nature of the importance of the mind so I think that's another way that this play is appropriate to start our conversation on script analysis is saying um, whatever you decide about a play is what is going to govern the way that it gets put on the stage if you think that your play is a comedy and you're the costume designer, then you're going to add funny hats. If you think that this character is struggling through such and such idea, then that's the way that you as an actor are going to play that. And then of course, as a director, where you choose to shine the spotlight on proverbially on the play is what's going to come out. So I just wanted to sort of encourage you to think of the importance of this work, not as a written exercise, not as something we just do at a desk, but as a blueprint to carry us into a larger production 
right? We don't want to just sit around and talk about ideas. We sit around and talk about ideas in order to learn how to stage, how to act, how to design. So these big ideas have real world, world consequences. It's a tongue twister this afternoon. Real world consequences. <laughs> um, and Laurence Olivier is pictured there because he did a very famous version of Hamlet um, in London, of course. If you know anything about the London theater scene, the Olivier Awards are the big kind of Tonys of the in case you don't know what the Tonys are, the Tonys are the American Broadway Musical Awards, and Olivier is a, um, you know, kind of like an Oscar for for, um, for Europe. So, <laughs> so everybody dies in a tragedy. We see at the end, lots of people die. Um, Hamlet is stabbed in poison, Claudius is stabbed in poison, Laertes is stabbed in poison, Polonius, um, Ophelia's father, is stabbed through a curtain, Gertrude, who's the queen, is poisoned, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are beheaded, and Ophelia drowns. So in case you're wondering about the genre of what Hamlet is, uh, it is a tragedy, hands down, no doubt about it. Very, very tragic play. So once again, that's part of the reason I hesitate, you know, when my niece asks me what my favorite play is. It's like, I love Hamlet. Uh, yeah, it's depressing, um, but he's struggling with real um, moral conundrums that I think are relatable. But creative ways that Shakespeare kills people is, is what the larger kind of meme that I'm referencing here, uh, exits pursued by a bear, is probably the most famous Shakespeare death, um, but there's lots of fun ones. And um, so your first term, and I'm going to outline lucky 13 terms during this lecture, your first term is inductive reasoning. I am not trying to um, condescend if this is a term that's very familiar to you, um, but it's sort of the cornerstone of a lot of Western thought is inductive re uh, reasoning. So if I have, if I'm watching uh, NCIS or one of those detective shows, I will sit and dust for fingerprints and then use those fingerprints to try to figure out who solved the murder. Right? I'm going to look at detailed information to draw conclusions. Sherlock Holmes is probably our superhero when we think about um, inductive reasoning, that person who looks at the fine details. So when we look at the methods outlined to us by our textbook author James Thomas, he wants us to read the play with a fine tooth comb. Right? We're not going to skim the play, we're not going to half watch the play while we're also um, you know, playing a game on our iPad or something. We really have to read it, read it, read it, and reread it. Um, so I really want to encourage you, if you've been given an assignment, maybe you're going to act in a play or design a play or direct a play, just try to immerse yourself in the text. Read it over and over and over again because you're going to be able to do that inductive reasoning by looking at things in detail looking at it through a detailed lens. Sherlock is infamous for having a um, magnifying glass in his hand, right? Sherlock goes over things with a magnifying glass, and I want us to be the kind of script analysis where we go through things with a magnifying glass. So, sort of the cornerstone, going all the way back to Aristotle in his um, famous works uh, about his uh, elements that he had for theater and if you took a theater appreciation class you probably studied Aristotle's element, elements but one thing that Aristotle really put importance on was the plot right the sequence of events uh, a plays noteworthy happenings and particularly in Western storytelling we have one event that logically leads us to a second event, which then leads to another event. Kind of like if you're watching a Criminal Minds show, right? We find a piece of evidence, it's a hubcap on the ground, and that fell off of the car from the hit and run, and then we're able to trace that hubcat back to an obscure Mustang that was only uh, produced in the you know 1967, and so then we're able to go find the car and catch the killer. 
we and Aristotle said we love this sort of certainty. We love to see the logic and have a clear victim and have a clear bad guy and that we sort of project that onto the plot, right? So in Western storytelling, we tend to have um, a clear plot development that happens through the noteworthy happenings, the noteworthy plot points and events. So one of our first jobs is to look at what is the sequence of external events. And by external events, we mean things that we can put our hands on, right? When does the character enter? When do they exit? Who are they meeting up with? Who are they talking to? Does a messenger show up? That's probably an external event, right? Um, the first time uh, that you kiss her, the first time that you tell her you love her. If I were to ask you about your relationship with your partner and I said, you know, tell me how you guys got together or tell me how you asked him or her to marry you, right? We're talking about external events. Right, and so in our story, that may mean a meeting, that may mean a death, but those tangible things you can put your hands on. So James Thomas lays out the external events of the first act of Hamlet, right? Um, so we have in in the first act of Hamlet. First, we have those guards, and they're talking. And then um, Horatio shows up and the ghost shows up. Now in our cutting, if you watch the David Tennant version with me, we have this interesting device where we switch into um, the cameras that are sort of telling us what the real reality is. And then we have sort of the perception of the guards and of Horatio. So this screenshot I took here is of the cameras showing that there isn't a ghost, but of course, Horatio and the guards see a ghost and through that discussion about okay we have to protect ourselves as a nation of Denmark they decide they need to tell Hamlet um, and it may be a little bit confusing because of course Hamlet the prince the prince of Denmark is junior and then we have Hamlet senior so for the purposes of clarity we're just going to uh, refer to Hamlet Sr. as the ghost, right? Hamlet Sr. is the ghost and Hamlet Jr. is the um, Prince of Denmark. He's our title hero of the story. So external events, you can see all of these things are things that we can put clear moments to, right? Somebody enters, a ghost enters, they talk about that ghost, the ghost shows up again, Right, they talk about whether or not they should tell Hamlet, they decide to tell Hamlet. So these are clear, tangible events that happen through the dialogue, through the stage blocking. And um, for those of you who are new, new to theater, when I see, say stage directions and blocking, I mean the movement that the actors do on stage, and the stage directions are what the playwright or the um, first stage manager sort of tells you in parenthesis how you ought to move um, as an actor on stage. So it's, uh, I, I hate to jump into the jargon of theater if I know some people are brand new to theater. And if you are, welcome. I don't want to discourage you. And feel free to email me anytime if I'm using a word you don't know how to say um, because I may need to re record the lecture for people who uh, get lost in the jargon. So, so the express version, <laughs> this action analysis that James Thomas is giving for us here, he wants us to state it simply and, um, and to try to be as concise as possible, right? So if we just look at act one, just the first part of the play, and we try to make it as condensed as possible, right? This is just act one, scene one, but this is act one, uh, scenes one through four. So if we try to just condense all that down, first we see that Horatio, who is Hamlet's really good friend, encounters this ghost. Claudius, which you will remember, is um, Hamlet's uncle, um, takes the throne. Now, there's a common device, and it's been used in this BBC production, if that's the one that you're watching here, of the ghost being also played by Claudius. Um, because remember, Hamlet Sr. and Claudius are brothers, so they look very similar. And, um, 
and they're being mistaken for them for each other right to a certain extent um, in fact I think there are moments that Hamlet questions his paternity he asks is my uncle really my daddy or is Claudius truly my father um, but that's we digress we could get into all that detail work but I want to keep it simple um, but Claudius takes the throne and Hamlet is upset by this because it really feels fast and he feels like it's dishonoring uh, his father he you know has that kind of kickback to that and then of course we have this greater war plot that's going on Laertes um, goes to France uh, and runs away <laughs> and Hamlet um, meets the ghost and this is sort of a big event for us is when Hamlet gets to know the true whole truth I think part of the reason that in the discussion so far I've talked so much about true crime is at the end of the day Hamlet is sort of a whodunit right and Hamlet hears from the ghost of his father that uh, Claudius his uncle has killed his father but he hears this from an apparition and how much can you trust an apparition right is this just a convenient person to blame because if you've ever gone through a tragedy um, a loss there is this tendency to want to put blame somewhere and just fix the problem so is Hamlet um, creating this sort of apparition out of convenience or is this truly um, the truth is a big question as you know as we as observers watching Hamlet um, we had that built of intent and anticipation so term number four is the seed the seed so the seed is the basic subject of the play and one of the reasons why I kind of picked this book is they do a great job of sort of referring to different terms that you may hear other professional um, theater artists use. It's kind of intentional about being inclusive of all of the language from a lot of these different um, great thinkers. And um, the seed is one of those words that you'll hear if you work for um, great minds in the future, you may hear them using the word the seed. Um, and they just mean this central issue, right? The basic subject but it's got to be if it's the seed it's the root for the whole play right so we get to see a big oak tree with all of the bark and all of the interesting foliage right these leaves there's lots of nuance but it all goes down to this basic basic element so that's kind of what we mean by a seed it's sort of the root of everything right including and so this was a big concept at the time of Stanislavski so if you go on to take my acting class or maybe you have already taken my acting class we'll talk about Stan the man Konstantin Stanislavski and he and his works um, um, he talks a lot about the seed and having a concise vision for a whole play so um, this is a term that we'll unpack during the semester and one that will come up in other coursework. So the seed is not to be confused with a motif, right? So plays are complicated and there may be something that comes up a few different times in the play, but it only covers part of the play right we couldn't say that Hamlet is a play about a about female madness even though we may say Ophelia has killed herself for love you know she's gone crazy when her father is killed um, we say may say that Gertrude Hamlet's mother has made some rash decisions and she's fallen in love with her you know her baby daddy's brother you know she but they're only in two scenes so if we try to make the whole play about women when there are only two women in the play uh, then then we're not that's just a motif that's not the full story so you can have sort of a main theme and then have a motif that kind of reoccurs thematically you can kind of have a, a, um, a second theme but the seed has to be 
all-encompassing and the motif only comes up and sprinkled throughout the play. So it can be easy to confuse those two, try not to. So we have external events. Those are things that we can see that are tangible, a handshake, an entrance, and exits. But then we have the internal life of the mind that happens to our characters, right? When they encounter their own thoughts, when they make big decisions, right? We can see this conversation between um, the different characters in the play when they come to a decision. But then we have in Shakespeare often these monologue moments, right? And they are wrestling with their own internal events. And I have a picture of cap and gowns here because a lot of the issues, the internal events for you as students are grappling with picking a major, um, you know, deciding, do I want to do this theater thing? Do I not want to do this theater thing? Um, but we know it's good to wrestle with these big decisions, right? We know encountering our own thoughts um, leads to real world consequences. So we don't mean to say that internal events are not as important. They are the life of the mind and they result in direct action. They result in external events. So Hamlet wrestles with his idealism. That's sort of our seed is idealism. So let's take for my actors in the room, um, let's take a deeper look at what Hamlet is. So when we do character analysis, we want to say, okay, what do I say about my character? What do other people say about my character? How does what I say about my character match up to the way that I live, the things that I actually do? Um, and Hamlet is a complicated character, right? And he's played so many different ways um, that it, it is an interesting role for um, people to approach. Right? What's, what do we know about Hamlet? We know that he just graduated from the University of Wittenberg, which is a um, esteemed, entitled experience. Only the richest of the rich would have an opportunity to study at Wittenberg. The greatest minds were teaching there. Um, we know that Shakespeare himself didn't have an education like this, which is part of the reason that some people think that he couldn't possibly write the plays that he wrote because his father was illiterate and he was from um, Stratford-on-Avon and that's you know just a tiny little town. There's no way he had this opportunity to study at the University of Wittenberg. Shakespeare didn't like Hamlet did, so um, but I think that some of that nonsense is classist, that Shakespeare was smart and um, he was able to muster up his own education, but I digress. So we have all this philosophical language from Hamlet. It's pretty clear that Shakespeare was um, interested in philosophy. He was listening in the pubs. He was reading pamphlets that were going around. Um, and so he's wrestling with these big issues. And we also know that Shakespeare, as an author, had a twin son whose name was Hamnet. And that Hamnet passed away at a young age. And so this is obviously named for that namesake of that child that he lost. And so when he struggles with the loss of Hamlet Sr., of the ghost, um, he's obviously riding into his mourning um, over the death of his son, which is, of course, um, wrestling with greater issues through the sort of autobiographical way that the Hamlet is. We know that Hamlet has great ideas about what love is, but doesn't really know how to treat Ophelia, right? Um, she's, she's sort of neglected, she's sort of toyed with, and obviously he kills her father, but um, he's not a very experienced Don Juan kind of character like, say, Romeo. Romeo shows up in the first scene. Um, he's already talking about one girl and then he falls for Juliet. He's an experienced lover. Um, he, you know, refers very crassly to Rosalind's anatomy. Um, you know, Romeo has seen his fair share of ladies. Hamlet, not so much. As I've already said, he's poetic, which is my favorite thing about Hamlet. And as we find in the last scene, he's an excellent fencer. Not well enough to save his life, but kills lots of people, so good for him. Um, and the thing that James Thomas, our play, our writer of our textbook, hones in on is Hamlet's perfectionism. 
And we see thing that a lot with students of a certain age, right? That they have big ideas about how they want to change the world. And then we get out into the world and we face real world complicated situations. So Hamlet's been given all this great philosophy at the University of Wittenberg. He's been raised all his life to thinking about well, what kind of king am I going to be? Um, you may have heard before that Lion King is a version of Hamlet, right? And that um, uh, we have this sort of moment where we decide what kind of king am I going to be? And then when you suffer a great loss, you have to ask, um, I can never be a king like my father was. Um, so when we look at who Hamlet is, James Thomas really hones in on the fact that Hamlet is a perfectionist and he's someone who has big ideas and that those ideas um, get in the way of real world action because he has ideas but should he act on them you know that's a big question in Hamlet to be or not to be um, which is could be interpreted should I kill myself or not should I live or should I not live but it also could be interpreted should I act should I kill and avenge my father's death, even though I'm not really sure that Claudius did it, right? So when we look at the seed, we want to base all of the internal events based on that seed. So you see how many times ideal is in there. Idealism, ideals, idealism, ideals. How is Hamlet, how is every scene about these ideas and about his ideals? So when we have a clear picture like that, like James Thomas has given us, then we can stage the play, we can act the play, we can costume the play with Hamlet's idealism in mind, right? And when it all revolves around that, we have a unified vision, we have a unified look, and it brings all the puzzle pieces together. Now, don't want to overcomplicate it, but this is James Thomas's interpretation of Hamlet. It is not other interpretations of Hamlet that we've seen, and there are lots of them, right? This is just one person's text analysis. But that's kind of the fun part about theater is that your people go to see a play that they've already seen, right? I just went to go see Hello Dolly, and that was me seeing Betty Buckley as Dolly. I've seen the movie version with Barbara Streisand as Dolly, but Betty Buckley is a little bit older, right? And now, and as me seeing it in 2019, um, so we each have a different vision, and it's different from every actor you see playing Hamlet is going to play it differently. Every director directing Hamlet is going to direct it differently. So it's about interpretation. If I haven't already said that. Climax, this is hopefully a term you've heard before, the highest dramatic tension, right? The turning point in all of the action. So um, hopefully this is a chart that you've seen in English classes growing up. Um, but the climaxes, when we stage them, they need to have high stakes, life or death, right? The moment they kiss, um, your first night with her, right? Whatever the climax is, it needs to have an intensity to it. Um, it needs to have your audience on bated breath. Now here's where it gets a little bit more complicated in the way that James Thomas lays it out. He thinks of the beginning, the middle, and the end as having major climaxes that incite it. So here we see um, exposition. Some people at the crooks of this first corner would say there's an inciting incident that begins the rising action, right? So that would be our first climax, right? Um, and the term, sorry, term eight is events which form the beginning, middle, and end, the three most important events in the play. So the first sort of inciting incident in Hamlet or our beginning climax is Hamlet finding out from the ghost that Claudius is the one who killed Hamlet Sr. Right? The ghost tells Hamlet, I was killed by Claudius. Claudius put poison in my ear, which is a very specific death, which is depicted in the picture here I took of the play within the play. Right? So the middle climax of the play within the play 
is when Hamlet, the Prince Hamlet, depicts by directing this little play within a play, poison being poured into the king's ear in order to kill him. And of course, Claudius gets upset and walks out, which is behaving like he's guilty, right? Which helps Hamlet solidify in his mind, okay, Claudius has killed my father. Um, my, the ghost was telling the truth. The ghost really was Hamlet Sr. Claudius has killed my father. And then, of course, <laughs> I just put everybody dies, which is partly my sense of humor. I don't mean to condescend, um, but at the end of Hamlet, it is very typical Shakespeare in that the body is littered with state uh, with the stage is littered with bodies, dead bodies. Um, Hamlet and Claudius are in this um, sword fight and um, very climactic death that occurs at the end is obviously these four deaths on stage, if not more. Um, point to the final climax of the story. Um, and so we've got multiple little mini roller coaster highs and lows, right? We've got um, exposition, exposition, exposition. Hamlet discovers from the ghost, goes back down. Exposition, exposition 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 Claudius walks out and Hamlet decides he killed him right then we get to the you know very last in the roller coaster the highest peak going all the way up Hamlet fully confronts Claudius they're fighting you know everybody dies so that's the big sort of reveal at the end what the audience has been waiting for the satisfaction of the main questions right comes through that major climax at the end so we're on to term number nine I'm doing pretty good here at just booking along I hope I'm not losing you guys term number nine from our textbook is theme Right, specific and distinctive quality, characteristic or concern of an artistic work, right? Covers the whole play and sums up the play's ideology, right? So we've talked about the seed, right? And the seed in this play is idealism, right? He's he's wrestling with his own perfectionism he's got these high-minded ideas about the way the world ought to operate but he's stuck in Denmark where there is all this injustice so he's struggling with the injustice of Denmark and whether or not he as a young man has the power the strength the gravitas to take on this injustice and make the world better right so the theme is the point of view expressed about the seed so I didn't there's a typo there somewhere the point of view the seed expresses about that ought to be the theme sorry the point of view the seed expresses about the theme so the point of view that we see from Shakespeare <laughs> is that Hamlet is young and impossibly idealistic right that the point of view is don't be, don't lose the action in the thinking, right? Um, don't overthink it. Decide and move forward, right? Um, don't get stopped, so caught up in the thinking that you forget to live, I think, is, is sort of Shakespeare's point of view about idealism. And we have this chilling graveyard scene where Hamlet confronts this um, ghost, this body, which was Yorick, and Yorick uh, was the jester in the court who he often rode on his shoulders, he often joked and played with him, and so to see his body um, dead in the ground now, and this is the iconic image we get from Hamlet, is him looking at the skull and contemplating his own morality, uh, mortality, sorry, contemplating his own mortality, and saying, um, you know, I need to, I need to just decide, but he's stuck in this restlessness of trying to decide. Poor Yorick, um, who is dead in the ground, and which is of course foreshadowing because Hamlet's about to be dead in the ground. So, term number 10, we have super objective. The super objective. So we're starting to put it all together here, right? the super 
objective. The, um, the super objective is once again one of those terms that will come, come about in the, in the great works of Stanislavski. And it hints at um, the behavior. So the theme of something um, gives, it's hard to act out a theme, right? But you as an actor, and we'll talk more about this when we get into Stanislavski, um, you need to decide what are your objectives, right? What are you in a scene? Are you there in, and I'm going to once again use the relationship stuff, right? You bring her flowers. Are you trying to impress her? Are you trying to woo her? Are you trying to seduce her? You need to decide in every moment what do you want and how what is your goal and how are you working towards that goal right it's very hard to act a theme right when we when we think about the themes of the play okay we're, this person is wrestling with God this person is wrestling with whether they shouldn't or shouldn't act um, you know those can be hints at it but we need to see Hamlet have a goal and not just sit around on stage and mope. Um, that's not a goal. People don't just mope to mope. Uh, people mope in order, you know, when my four-year-old son mopes, he wants me to come help him, right? He's whining. He wants me to come fix it. <laughs> and Hamlet is not just wrestling with these things, but his objective is to set it right. And we see him here yelling at his actors, um, speak the speech, I pray you, uh, as it is written down to you, right? He's, he's taking it so seriously because he wants this play and it does it it points to Claudius and shows him the truth and that Hamlet knows what Claudius has done to Hamlet senior and um, it, he's actively trying to set things right when we see these horrible injustices in our society we want to go after them right we want to set it right so and I feel like this has been a theme over and over again, but I just wanted to give Albert Einstein credit for what I think James Thomas is doing with our action analysis, is that you need to be able to say it simply. When someone asks you, what's your play about? Right? They don't want to hear <laughs> all of this minutia about Ophelia or Gertrude or Gro uh, Rosencrantz or Guildenstern. Or, they need to know simply what's your play about right so you as a director especially need to be able to say in one sentence decide who the protagonist is decide what the action of that is and be able to say in one sentence and include all these things we've already talked about the hero's objective the theme of the play the seed of the play so the one that James Thomas gives us is an idealistic student prince vows to purge the corruption from the rotten state of Denmark, right? So that's a one sentence, super simplistic analysis of a three hour play. But as Albert Einstein says, if you can say it simply, then you understand it fully, right? And while we can have motifs about Ophelia, we can have motifs about paternity and Gertrude, Hamlet is our hero, right? And he is vowing to purge, right? That is that is active language. And we talk about that over and over again in acting class. We want to find those objectives. We want to find those goals. We're going to find the things that we can activate, um, not just focusing on a mood or a way to play, a feeling. The feelings come secondary, right first comes our objective and that's basic Stanislavski um, acting theory so this is a term hopefully that you have heard before but I would be amiss if in our first chapter we didn't go over that Hamlet is our protagonist right he carries the action now when we have a genre of a play where we have an unlikable hero, right? A flawed hero. That doesn't necessarily mean that the main character is the good guy. Hamlet does some pretty bad things, like kill the father of the woman he loves, 
right? <laughs> He's not a perfect character. Protagonist, we see that word pro and we automatically think, okay, this is the good guy. And in many cases, it is the good guy. But the protagonist is the person who carries us through the story. Claudius is our antagonist. And when we look at the script and start kind of unpacking what all of the ways that he is the counter through action, that he is the absolute opposite. He has settled in his cynical, murdering way for his way to get justice to bring about for himself. He's the polar opposite to our protagonist. He's the savage beast. And if we're looking at... Um, you know, Lion King, we have those great moments too of of the counter of of the uncle and we see Scar's sort of um, horrible uh, personality and um, ways that he opposes the main character at every turn. I think that um, it makes it very approachable that way. So when we talk about the setting in this rotten state of Denmark. That's an extension of Claudius, right? He is part of the stench in the air. He is part of the injustice. He is in part of uh, what's wrong. So when we go back to that through statement, through that action statement, um, you know, Claudius is all over everything. He's the bad that exists, the injustice that exists, and that Hamlet is so apt to criticize. So. I hope that this has not been too much of a whirlwind. There's, of course, much greater detail in our textbook, Script Analysis for Actors, Directors, and Designers. And I would encourage you to read it, to reread it, to look at that summary there at the end that gives sort of a concise, um, a concise version of it. And, um, you know, decide for yourself what you think Hamlet is about and what it means so that when you go into that conversations with other um, professional theater artists that you have something to bring to the table um, because it's great. It's great fodder for conversation. It's great to chew on and to think about and to find your favorite quotes from it. But when we get into seriously analyzing a play, we need to make it simple. And he sure did show, choose a hard play to make simple. I hope I've made it simple for you today. Um, all right. So we've covered chapter one. We've covered Hamlet. It's now time to take the quiz over both. I would like you to um, get into the discussion question and answer that. Um, make sure that you've taken lots of notes. Now remember, these quizzes are only a small part of your grade. And um, I can't tell you to put away your notes. I know you're sitting in front of a computer wherever you are. But remember, a lot of these terms are going to show up on that proctored final exam. You need to go on ground to take that proctored final exam. And that will be without your notes, without your book. So um, use this as a stepping stone towards that big um, final project. And of course, these discussion questions, these papers that you're doing, um, you need to be processing. I need to see that you're processing this content. So the quizzes are only a small milestone. I hope you're taking good notes. I hope you're chewing on this. I hope you know that my email is open if you want to ask me questions about Hamlet, if you want to ask me questions about our textbook. And thank you for listening.